Super Mario Land 2 is easily one of the best games for the black and white Game Boy, and it manages to do this by simply adhering to the basic limitations of the Game Boy's hardware without too much flair. By taking a look at Super Mario Land 2, we can get a pretty good sense of how sprites make their way from binary data stored on a ROM cartridge to Mario running and jumping around the Mushroom Kingdom. This is a map of the Game Boy's memory. Now, this map has quite a lot of information on it, but for today, we only need to worry about the teal and pink portions of the map, video RAM, or VRAM, and object attribute memory, or OAM. The rest will be covered in a future video. VRAM is the collection of data from memory address hexadecimal 8000 to hexadecimal 9FFF that stores all graphic data for the Game Boy's LCD in the form of 8x8 tiles. These 8x8 tiles are used to make up the entire picture displayed on the LCD screen. However, the picture is made of three different layers, more or less stacked on top of each other. The first layer is the background layer, which is almost always used to draw the game world, such as in Super Mario Land 2. On top of that is a special type of background layer called the window layer. The window layer has no transparency and will cover all of the background tiles underneath it. However, it has a certain amount of limited movement, so it's often used to draw the HUD on top of the background. And lastly, we have the object layer, which consists of up to 40 objects on screen that can move independently across the screen on top of any other layers beneath them. This layer is mostly used for drawing character sprites and will be the focus for this video. In daily conversation, we tend to call any kind of thing that moves around the screen a sprite when referring to games. The Game Boy makes a slight distinction that we have to be careful of. This is Mario's sprite. And these are the Game Boy objects that make up Mario's sprite, hence the name Object Attribute Memory. Just like with VRAM, Emulators like Emulicious will display the data in OAM as graphics in the data viewing tool. The Game Boy is capable of displaying up to 40 objects on screen at a time, each of which has its data stored in OAM. How many sprites that is depends on how many objects those sprites are made of. Mario's sprite alone takes up 8 objects when he's in Super Mario form, but only six when he's small Mario. So accounting for this, there is, in the case where we are Super Mario, 32 more available objects that the Game Boy can fit into OAM for a total of 40 objects. That means we can only draw five instances of Mario before we run out of room in OAM under normal circumstances. Objects also have their own set of certain restrictions that they have to abide by. One major limiting factor is that only 10 objects can be displayed on a single scan line. If an 11th object is placed on the same horizontal line, it simply will not be rendered. To get around this, programmers often shuffle the order in which objects are written so that at any given moment, only 10 objects will be displayed, but which 10 are shown will change on every frame. As players, we refer to this as flicker. That's right, Flickr is not a built-in feature of old games, but rather a workaround programmers use to get around the restrictions of the hardware. Super Mario Land 2 actually does not do this object shuffling, and instead is just designed in such a way that there aren't any instances, at least that I could find, in the game where more than 10 objects are lined up in a row. As discussed earlier, Mario's sprite is made up of several different objects, so we have to keep track of each object individually in order to keep Mario together as we move around the screen. Each object in OAM has four bytes to keep track of the object's data. These four bytes are used for an object's vertical Y position, its horizontal X position, its tile ID, 
and its attributes. Let's start with the X and Y coordinates first. If you remember learning about how to read Cartesian or XY coordinates from school, then you may be upset to find out that the Game Boy starts its coordinate system with the top left corner of the screen being 00, zero where increasing our Y value brings an object down the screen and decreasing it brings the object back up. After the Y and X coordinate bytes comes the tile ID byte. Tile data for the objects is always located in VRAM between memory addresses hex 8000 and hex 8FFF. The tile ID byte is simply a number between 0 and 255 that lets the picture processing unit, or PPU, know which tile in video RAM to use for the object. A value of 0 corresponds to the first tile in VRAM at address hex 8000, and a value of 255 corresponds to the last tile in our range, which is the tile located at hex 8FF0. The last byte for any object in OAM is the attribute byte. This byte contains information regarding how to display the object. For the DMG, or black and white Game Boy, the possible attributes it can have are a vertical or horizontal flip, which of the two object palettes the object will use, and whether the object should be displayed in front of or behind the background and window layers. The X and Y flip work pretty much how you would expect them to. The Y flip flips the object vertically, and the X flip does the same horizontally. This is incredibly helpful for having characters like Mario run left and right without having to draw an entirely new set of animation frames for both directions. The background priority bit determines whether or not an object will be displayed in front of or behind the background. If it's in front of the background, then the objects will simply be fully visible at all times, no matter what kind of background they are over. But if they're set to be behind the background, then an object will only be visible on the zero index background color in the background palette. We can see in this example how my space Tombo is only visible when he's flying over white background tiles, as white is set to be the zero index color in this example program. This technique is used as piranha plants come in and out of their pipes. In this section in the tree zone, the zero index background color is set to light gray, so the piranha plant is only displayed over the gray leafy background and seems to disappear inside of the pipe when, in reality, his object priority bit is just set to zero, so he's only displayed over the gray zero index color. The last bit I'd like to touch on is the way that the Game Boy handles object on object overlap. The way this is handled on many other consoles of the time, such as the Sega Master System, is that objects that were placed in OAM first will be the ones to be displayed on top. However, <laughs> that is not the case with the Game Boy. Instead, the object with the lower X coordinate value is the one to be displayed on top. Take this portion of the map in Super Mario Land 2. When we clear a level, the white dot denoting a level becomes a black ring. However, this is not a change in the background, but rather an object placed over the background. If Mario walks across the black ring, we can see that half of Mario is covered by the black ring, and half of him is not. Take a look at Mario's sprite. Map Screen Mario is made up of four 8x8 sized objects. The two objects on the left in this instance have an X coordinate value of 75, and the two that make up his right half have an X value of 83. The black ring, however, is only made of one 8x8 object with an X coordinate value of 79. This means that Mario's left half has a lower X coordinate value than the black ring, and therefore is displayed on top of it. But Mario's right half has a higher X coordinate value, and therefore the black ring is displayed on top of Mario's right half. I find this behavior to be an incredibly odd design for objects, but most of the time a player probably wouldn't notice this. There is, however, at least one instance in Super Mario Land 2 where this odd behavior is exploited in order to pull off a neat little graphical trick. During the bonus crane game, there are two possible outcomes. 
either you win and the item is brought over and dropped to you, or you lose and the crane whiffs the items. The crane claw actually uses the same closed claw object for both scenarios. Our crane claw is only one object wide, but the items are all two objects wide. So since the claw is placed in the middle of the two item objects, the left half of the items will have a lower x value than the claw, but the right half will have a higher value than the claw. This makes it look like the claw is pinching the item to hold onto it, where one arm is in front of the item and the other is behind it. Hopefully, I was able to teach you something about the Game Boy and the way that it handles sprites. If you'd like to support me in an effort to make more in-depth technical content about the Game Boy, its games, and perhaps other systems too, and you have the means, I would be honored if you supported me on Patreon. If you're interested in homebrew Game Boy games, I'll also be uploading demo ROMs for my upcoming Super Game Boy game, Space Tombo, on my Patreon as well. And lastly, if you're interested in the source code for the ROMs I made to show off some of these object features, those can be found on my GitHub page. And I'll have links to both my Patreon and GitHub in the description below. As always, I'm Boffner, and thanks for watching. See ya!